Welcome to Episode 8 of the Student Pilot Cast, Moving On Up. I'm your host, Bill Williams. Please join me as I take you through my endeavors of learning to fly. In Episode 7, I brought you up to speed on my first two solos. At Chandler Air Service, where I'm training, which is a Part 141 school, the four stages of training are clearly defined in the syllabus, and each stage comes with a stage check, wherein I fly with one of the more senior instructors and they assess whether or not I'm ready to move on to the next stage. I had to complete this stage check for uh, stage one before I could solo, for instance. Well, in my syllabus, the solo flights are my first flights as part of stage two. So I've named this episode Moving On Up, as I now go headlong into the second stage of my training. So join me as I start to complete this second of four stages. The subtitle, 190 at 20, Gus 28, will become more clear as we move on. Chandler Tower, Cherokee 4121 Tango's at Chandler Air Service. We have Zulu, and uh, we'd like a south departure, please. What does it say to be an angel? Where does the sun go when it sleeps? First, some housekeeping. I'm flying an average of three times a week, and I'm finding it daunting to try and recap every flight once a week for my episodes. If you haven't noticed, I've been trying to get an episode out every seven to ten days. I may try something a little different now, and just release more, but shorter, more succinct episodes, rather than let the flights build up. This might be easier for me, and frankly, a little more enjoyable for you. That might mean two or maybe three episodes each week. We'll see how that goes. If it doesn't work out, I'll let you know. But let's get started with the training. Okay, so after my two solos, I was ready to be introduced to some more skills and be provided the opportunity to do solo flights to practice these and some of the other skills that I've already learned. I did a couple of flights with my instructor. The first one to review some of my previous skills, such as minimum controllable airspeed, steep turns, and practice some emergency procedures. Then the next one was to go over ground reference maneuvers again and get some hood work in. We'll pick up on that flight. First, let me tell you why. Normally, from here on out in my training, the syllabus calls for some instruction or review on some topics, and then a solo flight to further practice those skills or maneuvers. It's not 100% like that, but in general, that's how it's outlined for stages 2, 3, and 4. That said, Larry and I decided to do a couple of these lessons out of order because of several reasons. First, scheduling. It's much harder to schedule Larry's time than it is to just schedule a plane for a solo. And because my schedule is very busy as well, if I can get a mutual time free to do a dual lesson with him, I'll take it, even if it's out of order. Second, the weather can play a role as well, and that was the case here. I can't remember if this was supposed to be a dual flight or not, but it turned out it was perfect for ground reference maneuver practice. My first introduction to ground reference maneuvers turned out to be on a pretty calm day, so today was perfect for my second time. So we decided to head out and do these, plus some hood time. I'll start with the ATIS and ground call so you get an idea of what the wind was like. Hazardous weather information available on high wash, flight watch, and flight service frequencies. Advise on initial contact, you have Zulu. Channel Tower, yeah, information that's... Zulu, time 1615 Zulu. Wind 190 at 20, gust 28, visibility 15, sky condition overcast 12000, temperature 21, 2.08, altimeter 2937, visual approach in use, landing and departing runways 22, left and right. No TAM, caution for multiple obstructions in the vicinity of Central Airport, up to 310 feet AGL. Use caution for bird activity in the vicinity of Chandler. Hazardous weather information available on high... Enter, enter. Chandler Tower, Cherokee 4121 Tango, it's a Chandler Air Service. We have Zulu, and uh, we'd like a south departure, please. Cherokee 4121 Tango, Chandler Ground, taxi to runway 22 right via taxiway Alpha in November. Taxi to 22 right via Alpha in November, Cherokee 21 Tango. So we were on our way out in some uh, pretty hefty winds. One of uh, the other things to note here is that during the run-up, I noticed that the attitude indicator, the instrument that tells you the attitude of the airplane with respect to roll and pitch, was acting a little flaky. The plane we were we were in that day is actually a very nice one. It's a Warrior Three, later model than the Warrior Twos that I normally fly. But nevertheless, the artificial horizon was not working quite right. Since this was a VFR flight where we uh, had the real horizon to use, 
and we still had the turn coordinator and other instruments if we needed them. We were fine to take off. Besides, I think maybe, just maybe, Larry had a diabolical plan from the beginning. Stay tuned for for that part. For now, we were going to take off, head towards some fields in the practice area to do some ground reference maneuvers. Responder on altitude. Mixture of orange. We don't have far to go here. Nope. <laughs> Dead. Don't get over any part of that line until you... Okay, yeah, we're still clear. Channel and Tower Cherokee 4121 Tango is at 22 right, ready for departure. Trigger 4121 Tango, Channel and Tower, fly runway heading, winds 180-19, gust 25, runway 22 right, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, 22 right, fly runway heading, Cherokee 21 Tango. Little wind from the left, so we'll just kind of roll those ailerons over there. As you go down the runway, just then as you take off, you'll obviously level it. Yeah. Channel Tower, hook up to 7534 Delta 6 to the northwest inbound for the helipad with Zulu. Okay. Hook up to 7534 Delta Tower, report a mile north. It's not 28, it went down to 25, so no problem. Delta, Air speed is moving. Popped us right off the ground, that little way to wind. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what the visibility looks up here. We'll go up, let's try, uh, uh, we'll go to about uh, 2,500, huh? maybe 3,000, because uh, what I want to do too is if, with this wind blowing, we could try some ground reference maneuvers out there with a real strong wind. It'll... Yeah, it's a good time to do it, huh? Yep. Trigger 2 one tango, left turn southbound approved. Left turn approved, Turkey 2 1 Tango. Yeah, this looks like a Michigan day, it sure does. So, were they were the tanks on the tabs, or were they? I'm they assuming were, they yeah. were on the tabs. They yeah, were. that right tank showing full, isn't it? Yeah, the, the right tank was a little more full, but uh -oh, I mean, okay. it was like maybe a, a yeah. centimeter above the tank. Oh, okay. Not that much more. Yeah. Let's see, just yeah, attitude indicators, I don't know if it's working or not. Turn coordinator is a little bit sensitive, but we could try it when we get here to 2,500. Just on the way out there, maybe do a little bit of work. Yeah, well, look at that turn coordinator, man. Turn coordinator bounces around. See what happens in actual instrument conditions if you lost your vacuum pump, you have no choice but to use the turn coordinator to keep the wings level, but that's bouncing so much, that would be hard to do. In turbulence, it would be really hard, I would think, to keep those wings level. Why is it bouncing, though? It's not even turbulent. Yeah, I don't know. It's a pretty smooth day. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I usually don't see them quite that sensitive, you know. That's right. A twitchy turn coordinator, a basically inoperative attitude indicator, a hood, and a sadistic instructor. Nah, I'm just kidding. Larry's not sadistic, actually, but the circumstances were such that I was going to end up doing partial panel hood work, even though it was only to be my second time under the hood. Why don't you just, for the heck of it, let's put the hood on right here. Huh? Once you're trimmed and ready to go, and I'll just vector you around out there for a few minutes. And you've done... Oh, I should have reviewed it. We'll see if we can get we can use that attitude indicator. It's sort of working. Yeah, it's kind of working. <laughs> Go ahead. I got it for a moment here. Got it. Okay. I'm trying to get that level up again. I don't know. That might have been showing. But I'll let you adjust it as appropriate. We'll stay at 2,500. Just get just keep the scan going. How much of this have you done? I, I know I point three hours. I was going to say I knew it was point two or point three. So what you want to do is the center of your scan is the attitude indicator out and back to every instrument on there now. the approach and report two miles. Out and back, out and back. Don't omit anything. Don't fixate on anything. The center, the most information you get if you accidentally went IFR is right out of that attitude indicator. What heading do you want me on? Just stay right on this heading right here. It's fine. 16. Yeah. 160. Yeah, we should check that with the wet compass here, with the magnetic compass in a moment here. Straight and level, three seconds. Yeah, it's pretty close. It's showing about south on our magnetic compass here, so you're pretty close. Okay. Uh, like I said, if, if you ever inadvertently went IFR, I tell people the first thing, don't do anything. I mean, you just catch your breath, take a deep breath, keep the airplane under control, stay straight and level. First of all, I told you to scan, scan, scan. 
you know, keep the center of your focus is that attitude indicator. That's where you get the most information out back to every single instrument. I just don't trust it today. And everything <laughs> slow. You can double check it with this and yeah, double check and it with that. that. You yep. can check your heading with that. And that's the, actually the primary instrument for... And that's what's happening. That's why I keep drifting left heading. is because that thing yeah. is... Yeah. It just keeps the scan going. Watch this, watch this, and this. Yeah. Yeah, I think so this is actually uh, making it a little more difficult for me, so that's good. Yeah, it is making it a little more difficult. You're right. So you'll have, that means you'll have to keep that scan going to keep the wings straight and level. So we go a few more minutes, and the attitude indicator was working enough to fool you into starting to believe it, but it wasn't actually accurate. So I had to keep telling myself not to trust it and look at the turn coordinator and the heading indicator. We'll pick back up there. I'll just let this play for a while. I go. I can see that attitude here is giving you fits here. Oh yeah, it's horrible. I'll tell you what, this time let me do partial panel here, just for a moment. See if you can try to keep it approximately level okay. with that. This is distracting. If you get an instrument that does not work, it can be distracting. So just now use your primary for your heading is that uh, directional gyro and try to keep your wings, wings level then with the attitude indicator. And it's bouncing around a little bit. So you're doing partial panel here. So we might not do a tons of this today. We'll do maybe two tenths today just because we're dealing with an airplane with it's not partial bad. panel. It's not really. bad practice, though. Yeah. And actually, when you get an instrument rating, you'll do partial panel. Because if you lost the engine-driven vacuum pump, which is not uncommon, you have no choice but to go to this instrument to keep your wings level. I lost the attitude indicator in instrument conditions once. Did you? And it was scary. Fortunately for me... I came out of the clouds probably within two or three minutes. I was coming down from Flint, Michigan. Were you on an IFR flight plan? Yes, and I was in the clouds. And uh, they gave me a turn to the right to a certain heading. I turned right, and the little airplane in the attitude, attitude indicator turned left. <laughs> and if I did not have that, oops, oops, I was instantly confused. Yeah, this is kind of a... It's almost lousy way of doing it. But it's almost it, good to keep a suction cup with you to. Yeah, because this is distracting. By the way, that's yeah. why instrument pilots do probably keep suction cups with them. That's going to fall off too, probably. Because you start looking at that, and it gets you unoriented, and that's what happened to me. As soon as I saw that plane going, but I instantly did not know where I was. Yeah. But I went right to that. Oh, this isn't going to hold. Nah, sorry, it's my last ditch effort. To, <laughs> uh, let me try. It. I tried to get the lick on that thing, get it wet, but okay. But you're, we'll do a little partial panel here. We might have to cut this short because this is such a. I should have. If I would have known, I would have thrown a suction cup in my pocket. Okay, uh, Warrior four one two one Tango. Let's turn left to heading zero nine zero. Left heading zero nine zero. And again, uh, you're doing exactly what you should do. What you've probably been taught by. Uh, was it Brian? You were Brian flying with Brian, right? Yeah. We just do. Is to if you don't come out of the clouds. My first, I first tell people what you want to do: keep the plane under control, get it straight level, take a deep breath, maybe turn around. Maybe your first strategy is to turn around. If you're too busy controlling the airplane, I wouldn't talk to anybody necessarily right then. But if you don't come out of it pretty quick, you're going to have to start talking to somebody. Yeah. So you aviate, navigate, and communicate. But the very first thing you would do is simply turn the airplane around. If you don't talk to anybody, then you better, if you don't know a frequency to call, you call on 121.5. You're in trouble. You know, that's an emergency. You'd need to get a vector to get out of that, out of those clouds. By the way, you're clear in this direction. I'm watching for you. Okay. I got the landing light on, too, just for... I'm always really pleased with the way, uh, like I said, you've got two tenths and you're doing very well under the hood. I really love to see people do that. So as you can see, I tell people that the main thing, main factor sometimes when you go out fire is just keeping yourself calm. Yeah. Because you can do this. Uh, you've got ten, you've got two tenths of hood work and you're in your your fifteenth minute of hood work here or something, and you're already doing partial panel. And again, it's just a matter of, uh, yeah, there you go. And let's moment check real quick on the wet compass here. It's showing a heading of about you know, almost 112 degrees. So, I mean 120 degrees. I'm sorry. I'll change that for you so oh, you can okay. you know, keep an eye out for airplanes here. We're not going to do a whole lot more, maybe five more minutes at the most. Sure. It ain't no thing. Yeah. Again, partial panel, I not only cover this up, but I cover this up. Because when you use the you lose the uh, uh -huh, that would be. vacuum pump, now you now you now you have to make time turns with a compass. Standard rate turn three degrees per second. 
So again, let's try it just for the fun of it. Okay. I'm going to start my stopwatch, and we're going to do another. Of course, when I look up at the compass, I can see out. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm not going to have you look up at the compass. Oh, okay. Uh, we'll look up at the compass when we start. You're on east, and then uh, I'll tell you to turn, and we'll, I'll, I'll time you for okay. 30 seconds here. Hold on one second. Just get it on ahead. Keep it on heading of east. Right. Yep. You just use this for the moment. And when you're ready, I'm going to cover it up. We're just going to count 30. Well, we got to have to count a minute to do a 180 degree turn. Right. So at any rate, we'll try a minute. In just four seconds here. One, two, three, four. Go ahead and start a standard rate turn to the right. Just keep the little airplane on that little hash mark. I can't see my. Uh... Oh, you're... <laughs> just watch this. Okay. <laughs> Let's get another piece of paper. Ignore the. We don't even have to cover it up, actually. We could just time it and see how it comes out. Uh, I did 15 seconds. I started you on 9.15. Standard return. We're going to turn for one minute. And that thing bounces around a lot. Yeah, just keep it approximately where it should be. I know it bounces a lot, but you're doing well. So you got about 20 seconds to go. If you keep it at a standard rate, it should be 3 degrees per second. So if you had to make, in this case, we did... Uh, Better make a 180 degree turn. In five seconds, I'll take it out for him. Okay. Five? Okay, right there. Now we got pretty close to west. Yeah. And again, if you were making, if for example, you're flying in your partial panel, and again, this I wasn't intending this lesson to be partial panel for your second uh, under the hood <laughs> lesson here. But again, if you didn't have either of these, you'd have to use the wet compass. You're right. And what you do is you could, you could, if you wanted to do 10 degrees to the right, you just turn for about three seconds. One Mississippi two, Mississippi three, Mississippi roll the wings level, and you. Okay, yeah, we'll put it right on west. We don't have much more to go, so let's just go ahead and. Uh, Again, if you called somebody, for example, you call Phoenix Approach and you're talking to them, it'd be Phoenix Approach or Warrior 412 Tango, and they'd give you they'd give you headings just like I'm doing. 412. In this case, let's try a descent. You know, we'll get on to 2,000 here. So, for Warrior 412 Tango, descend and maintain 2,000 feet. Okay. So again, descend to 2,000. Again, unfortunately, we don't have. Let's go ahead and use this if we can. Just put the little airplane below the horizon about a bar width and pull the power back a little bit if you want to do a constant airspeed descent. And you, yeah, we'll just use that for what we can. I primarily look at this one if you want. Again, if you had to descend down through some clouds, you obviously wouldn't do that unless you were talking to somebody. Yeah. Because you don't want to run into a cloud, even run into a mountain as you're going down through these clouds. I'd set up a constant rate descent. In other words, pull the throttle back to constant airspeed descent. Trim it for that descent. You also might think, and I didn't mention this, when you're in clouds, thinking about using carburetor heat. If you have visible moisture right. in clouds, you might get carb ice. Right. Yeah. And then it just prior to reaching 2,000 feet, I say they've said the book's like 150 feet prior. But in this case, when you're at least 50 feet prior, I'd start pushing that, pitching that nose up and adding power in to level off at 2,000 feet. It, it'd be easier almost to descend down through something because all you really have to do is reduce a little bit of power, drop the nose, maybe put the carbine on if you had to go down through clouds and we come out the bottom of the just clouds. Just keep those wings level. Go ahead and anticipate yeah. this. So go and get a little bit of power in. And put that little airplane on the horizon. Primary for pitch, actually, it's probably this right yeah. here. Primary for pitch, primary for heading. You always use this when you're making changes. Unfortunately, you're doing partial panel today. Yeah. So. Uh, I think we're okay. Let's good go here. ahead and let's go ahead and take the hood off. Okay, you got ready? it. I got it. And you got it back. Oh, okay, let's go. We can head back to the fields here or something out here. Where, where the heck house. are we? We're just uh, oh, west okay. of the green fields here. So. All right. You want to go back nice that way? Nice job, though. For even for partial panel, you did a really nice job. Um, Thank you. And I would urge you, I mean, uh, to get an instrument rating. If you're going to fly for any length of time, I tell everybody. I said, I'm not trying to sell instrument training wherever you go. I'm just saying, if you're going to fly for a long period of time, it'll, it'll make you a safer pilot, yeah. more confident pilot. I do not I do very little IFR flying, very little actual IFR flying, but I've done some. You yeah. know, Not a lot, but I've been in the clouds and had to fly the airplane by reference to the instruments, and it can save your life one day is what I'm telling you. If you're flying in Arizona all the time year-round, you probably don't have to worry about it a whole lot. But let's well, go back over the green fields here and uh, do turns around a point. Okay. So that concluded the instrument work for this flight. We went off to utilize the stiff winds for ground reference maneuvers. 
if you aren't a pilot and don't know what ground reference maneuvers are, it's essentially uh, an exercise to help students understand and deal with the effects of wind on your ground track. In private pilot training, there are three types of ground reference maneuvers. First, there's the rectangular course, where you basically mimic a traffic pattern. In each leg, you have to correct for the wind, both with a crab angle when there's a crosswind component on that leg, but also with uh, your angle of bank. If the wind is behind you, for instance, to maintain reference to the ground, you have to bank more steeply. And as you start turning, you have to release some of that bank angle as you move into the crab. For example, in this case, the turn was more than 90 degrees going from downwind to base because you have to move into a crab angle when you're on that base leg. When turning upwind from base, the turn will be less than 90 degrees and in shallower. The next maneuver in ground reference maneuvers is the, uh, are, are the S turns across a straight line. Using some of the same techniques to make sure you're perpendicular to the line as you cross it and that your path to the next crossing is actual actually a semicircle, not some oblong, egg-shaped thing. Since the wind is blowing perpendicular to the line you're using, it's blowing you away from the line. You have to correct for that. Lastly, there's the turns around a point, where you select a point and basically keep the plane going in a nice round circle with that point in the middle. This one requires constant correction, as each moment, because you're turning, the wind is having a slightly different effect on you. These maneuvers are done pretty low to the ground, under a thousand feet above ground level. You have to keep your altitude, correct for the wind, watch for traffic, and basically divide your attention between a few things. It's not particularly hard, but it does take some practice, and a windy day like this day was a good chance for that. We did turns around a point, and it took me a couple of cycles around to figure out the wind and to get the hang of it. Uh, just pick anything you want. Which one are we doing? Turns around a point. Okay. You can put it on your side. That's what I do when I'm okay. doing mine. Might be easier for you to have the point on your side, so make left turns. All right. So I'm going to just head this way so I can come around on a downwind. Okay. Uh, just pick anything you want. Which one are we doing? Turns around a point. Okay. You can put it on your side. That's what I do when I'm okay. doing mine. Might be easier for you to have the point on your side, so make left turns. All right. So I'm going to just head this way so I can come around on a downwind. Okay. I'll shut that line. Anyway. Oh, usually when I'm doing maneuvers, that's just a habit I have. I don't tell you that you have to do that, but... Actually, not that bad out here. Well, all right. Well, one thing is good, it's cool. Yeah. So we're getting close to a downwind here. About right here, so how about we use that? Okay. Something down here in an intersection or a big tree or something? Or? Yeah, the, the big double, the canal intersection with that. Okay. Let's stay, let's, uh, in this case, I wouldn't care if you stayed at 19, but let's stay at 2,000 if you can, oh, just because yeah. there's okay. houses down here. I don't want to make the people mad here. Okay, so we turn more. So we'll make sure we get up a little bit higher. I'm going to push your thumb up just a touch for you, if you don't mind. Okay, 2,400. Yeah, we won't bother them for long. I think we're more than 500 feet over them anyway, so. Am I about the right distance from that point? See, uh, Should I be closer? Are you talking about where those trees are at out there? Yeah. Yeah, I would get a little bit closer. Okay. You don't want to get, according to the practical test standards, it says about no more than about a 45-degree bank, so because some of the distance out depends on how hard the wind is blowing. If it's really blowing hard, now this is the end of the wind, so this might be shallow. This distance right here, I, I, I was, was just trying to get a little closer here. Okay, yeah. So I'll level it out and then start again. Again, if it's blowing real hard to get real close, you might have to crank it over to a 60-degree bank, so now the wind should be from our right, so it's going to try to push you into the point. So here's where you have to start steepening up as you go around this side of it. This is a divide your attention maneuver, so it's divide yep. your attention between the point, the ground, on the ground there, other traffic, your altitude, 
push that throttle up because we lost a little alpha. Here's the downwind portion, so it's going to try to push you away here. Yeah. So you're steep steep it is, steeping this turn is through here, and we're getting, so you can see we got a little wider here. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to have to start that steeper turn okay. a little sooner because we got blown way out here. Yep. But now you're starting to go into the wind. Well, usually, you know, once you've learned how to do this, and you come out and practice on your own one day and to get your license, Whoa. It, will, it will not matter what heading you start on. You'll automatically start realizing where the wind is from and start correcting for it. Because, you know, into the wind, you start to shallow out here, this distance right here all the way around. See, we're fairly close here. So if you were to keep that close, we're going to have to, the wind is off our nose here. So, again, you keep it shallow to get the distance out you want to be. If you can pick reference points around the point, that will keep you, uh, that's fine. But a lot of times you don't. You just have to eyeball it. Now the wind is from our right. It's going to start pushing us here. It's going to want to push us out away from the point. So we're going to get wider over here. So you can start, see right here we're in a 45-degree bank. So if we get too close, when the wind's really strong, we might have to bank over 45 degrees. But right here is your steepest turn. And to get the same distance out, I'd hold that bank in for a couple seconds longer. Yeah, now you compensate it for it. Look at the clump of trees. Now you're now you're the same distance. That's a lot better right there. It's trying to push us away right here. Yeah. Well, it's good when there's wind. It's still trying to push us away. You got a little close on this side. Yeah, we? I did. Uh, are we using the... Uh, what's, uh, what's under the wing over there, that yeah. clump of trees yeah. at that intersection? Yeah. Good, yeah, right. I didn't let it get a little close there. Yeah, we got kind of close on that side, but you you are compensating here. At least the wind is blowing hard enough that you you can see what that wind is trying to do to you. Yeah. Yeah, we got kind of a little close on that side, so. Yeah, so it's just remember to keep yourself busy looking for traffic, looking for watch, checking your altimeter now and then if you need to, watching that you stay at equal distance all the way around this point. So yeah, we got kind of wide on the uh, east yep. side of the point here. Just stay an equal distance from it all the way around. And do whatever you need to do as you're looking at the point, checking your altimeter, you're varying your bank angle. Yeah, now, they would, now we'll start to shallow it out here. We're starting to turn in the wind. We don't want to get too close on the on this side of that point. I'm looking at that big clump of trees. I don't know if that's what you're that's using. That's what I'm using. Okay. Yeah. We'll go a couple times. And get now we're into the wind, so it can be fairly shallow here, but just shallow to get out to the distance you want to be. Right. I don't know if you want to use this next road or whatever that is there. Yeah, don't worry about the wings. Just stay at equal distance from that point. This distance right here all the way around. Now the wind's going to start pushing us in towards the point as we come around the corner here. So you have to start looking where that point is. We're going to get blown out farther out here. That wind might be more from our yeah from the southwest, I think is where it's from. So fairly steep there. Now you can... That Kept it, that kept it about the right space right there. About the right distance. It might be coming like out of this way. That's right. why we seem to be getting pushed out on the uh, northeast side of that, that uh, tree right I there. I think you're right. Yeah. That's why I'm having to keep it steep. And now you're kind of into the wind. It's either from here or right out here somewhere. So we're shallow here. See, we got kind of close here. You had to shallow it out. Now we're still shallow to get the distance out you want to be, dividing your attention. We're down to 1,800. Yeah. So nice gentle pull. Again, you don't want to get too slow. Yeah. And again, the wind's going to start pushing us around the corner. Here's where we're going to have to start banking because it's going to start pushing us away from that point. This is the end of the wind. We'll just go around one more time. All right. Now you drive to crazy around the point. It looks like this is kind of into the wind right here. Yeah. And somewhere out here. Again, when you practice on your own, just be careful. Look for traffic. Try to keep the same altitude. Don't get too slow in the steep turns. If you ever feel that buffet, you know you don't you don't want to be cranked over in a real real steep turn and get too slow. There, there spots underneath behind the left wing there, and here's where the wind is starting to push us. And again, we haven't really had to bank over 45 degrees. There's about 40 degrees of bank right there. Still trying to push us away. There's a closer to 45 right there. That's the steepest you want to bank, so kind of get used to this distance. Now we're now we're starting to come back into the wind. Okay, that's better. And when you're ready, we'll try turns across the road. If you want to take a break for a second, just set yourself up on a okay. Find yourself an east-west road or something. But take your time. Find something. Whatever they ask you to do this, by the way, on a check ride. You know, t you don't have to rush right into it, just like you did with me. You take your time, you pick a nice point, that's a good point, that's okay. the altitude, and uh, 
I'll show so you. So you want to use one what, of these? Yeah, whatever you want to use. Or actually, we yeah, can, the wind is from this yeah, direction, so I predominantly use a, a road that you want. You're not going to find something that's maybe exactly perpendicular to the wind, but right. if it's predominantly from the south, I pick an east-west road, and uh, this is pretty. These are pretty it, close. And enter on the downwind again. So to get here with all of them close together, you might have to keep track of which road you're using here, but that's true. Okay, so we went off to do some S turns. Here you go. Then, as you go back into the wind, you start to shallow it up and do whatever you need to do to get the the uh, longitudinal axis of the airplane perpendicular to the road as you go over it. If you turn too fast, you'll get perpendicular before. If you turn too slow, you won't be perpendicular. There you go. It's pretty good. Wings level. And they go to the right. Now we might be predominantly into the wind. So shallower. So it might be shallower. It, 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 you got to kind of visualize what's yeah. happening with the wind here. As you start to turn, at the same distance out on this side, the wind's starting to push you in towards the road. So there's where your bank starts to get steeper. Plus, yeah. we gained a little bit of altitude there. We want to keep it right at 2,000. So again, you can see where you got to keep yeah. that turn coming around. You're doing fine. And as you go over the road, perpendicular, pretty close. Over the road, left turn. It should be steep, steep. There's a steep to steep. Get the same distance on this side, dividing your tension very rapidly between the road, looking for airplanes, altitude, into shallow, shallow. This should, if we're into the wind, this should be a, end up being a little shallower turn, and maybe yeah. it is here. Shallow, into a shallow. Again, if the wind's blowing us in. it's just steep and then immediately you can start to do whatever you do to get the equal distance out over here so if you continue too steep you might not get the distance out on this side of the road that you want to be so right. that's working out pretty good though get a little more shallow here and yeah, there you go yeah that's exactly what i do i kind of watch where the longitudinal axis of the airplane is and time that turn so you're perpendicular that's exactly how i do it there yep not bad Running out of road. Just start back to the right this time. We'll do a couple more. You're doing this one pretty good. Again, my only caution would be watch for traffic. You're watching for traffic, and you're watching your altitude, and you're watching the road. So it's you're real busy during this maneuver. Yeah, I'll say. And again, but what what relieves you a lot of of a lot of the work is if you know where that nose is in a in a in a turn. The steeper you turn, you should know about where that nose should be as you best steepen up that bank and relieve you from having to look at the altimeter continuously. You should know about where it should be as you're turning. And you can tell when sometimes, I, and obviously you can tell, when you start descending, the RPMs start to increase. They, you can tell the plane's speeding up. It's kind of teaching you to fly the airplane by not only looking at the instruments but feeling what's happening and sensing right. what's happening with the airplane, too. Because you're dividing your attention so much, you can't afford to... You're looking at the instruments the whole time. You just occasionally glance at the altimeter. About the only thing I look at. Okay, we can stop on this one if you like. And the engine just quit. As you heard, we ended the maneuver, and Larry immediately pulled the power to simulate an engine-out emergency. Remember, ground reference maneuvers are done pretty low, and we were doing ours at, at about 2,000 feet MSL, which... Out there where we were was approximately 700 to 800 feet above the ground. That doesn't give you much time if you lose your engine. Okay. I don't have time for a restart, so I'm just going to put it down. Okay. All right, I'm going to put it on that, uh, on that dirt road right there next to the canal. I think I know what you're looking at. Heading back to the west, you mean? Yeah. Oh, okay. And I'm going to have to... Uh, Get on, get over those power lines. Just gotta clear your ones real quick. Yeah, you got a big field in here too. Right rudder. Oh, you're gonna slip. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know if there's a ridge on that too. You could probably head right into that yeah. field. Okay, you can go ahead and go around if you don't. Right. Don't worry about the flaps first. Smoothly yep. apply throttle. 
I think we stayed. Don't away. worry, I wasn't going to dump them. No, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, you you don't do that. So I, I wasn't real worried. I started to go, don't dump them, but yeah. I know you don't do that. That's very good, and I I try to emphasize that people. There's usually never a time that I just dump them all yeah. at once. But all right, we've yeah, got we'll, a positive rate, so okay, I'm going to slowly good. let them out. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, you had a big feel there too. I didn't know if you were going to land along that canal. There was a. I started uh, to, but then thing, that field yeah, looked better. The field looked so smooth <laughs> and flat, probably right into the wind. That would have worked. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can head back. So as you can see, when you're that low, there's just not much time. I actually neglected to finish my emergency procedures. Uh, by calling a mayday and mentioning that uh, in a real emergency, we would have turned the master switch off, leaned the mixture to idle cutoff, and turned the fuel off, as well as opened the door before touching down. I guess with the short amount of time, I was concentrating on landing the plane. I've got to remember to finish all of those procedures, though, so I'm working on that. So we headed back to the airport. We were asked to report our left downwind for 2-2 left by the tower, which is where we'll pick it up. It was a windy day, remember, so this would be a good practice for a crosswind landing. Not too dramatic. Larry tried to make it easier on me by asking me to set up in my side slip on final approach rather than crabbing in and then changing to the side slip just before touchdown. Chandler Tower, Cherokee 4121 Tango is turning on to downwind for 22 left. Cherokee 21 Tango, runway 22 left, clear to land. 22 left, clear to land, 21 uh, Tango. Wind 170 at 15, gust 25. Yeah, we got a nice crosswind to practice in. We got a little low in the downwind there, but that's okay. Yeah, we'll, nice. just, we'll correct for that. Again, a lot of people, too, when they get in the downwind, the first thing you do is reduce power, and if you don't hold the nose up, it starts to descend to you. So, kind of goes without saying. Okay, the wind is going to be coming left to right, correct? Uh huh. Just do whatever you have to do with the rudder. When you line up on final, to keep the nose straight. Whatever you have to do with the ailerons to keep it from drifting. So a little gusty too. So that that whatever you do might vary a little bit. And it's a little gusty. So and I probably told you, but I used half the gust speed, and I don't remember what the gust was too. If it's 15 to 25 or. If the gust is 10 knots, I add half of the gust speed to my approach speed, so it wouldn't be inappropriate to go a little bit faster on I'm your gonna, approach speed. I'm going to leave two notches okay. of flaps if that's all right. No, that's per, that's exactly what I do. Out here, if you want to practice your crosswind technique, as you're lined up on final here, push a whole lot of right rudder in okay. to get the nose straight. Push it real hard, hard as you need to push it, right there. And then hold a little left aileron down to keep you from drifting to the to the right. I'm, this is exactly I'm not on right. center line, though, so okay. let me drift over here. Okay. Yeah, just be... Don't let that wind push you around. Make it go where you want it to go. Get that rudder in to keep it straight. In case you're ever caught, man, in a crosswind, and it's more than you've ever handled. you just got to be aggressive. It'll, 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 it'll handle this crosswind. And just hold those inputs right down to above the runway and hold it off the runway. You can get it just enough above the runway. Again, if you want, what I would do here is, is work it down to the runway. A whole lot of right rudders. Get it straight like that. See how aggressive we, we can be with this? It just... Get it up just enough to get it up above the runway and let it land. There you go. All in all, a good flight. I learned a lot and got some good practice in the wind, as well as under the hood. I even got some partial panel in. I was scheduled to do my first solo away from the airport to go do some high air work practice in a couple of days. This would turn out to be a significant flight for me, and I'll cover that in the next episode. So to keep you up to speed on where I'm at, after my two solo flights, as well as the two flights with my instructor after that, which includes the one I talked about today, I was sitting at about 19 hours. A half hour of this was under the hood on instruments, and one hour of it was solo. Thanks for taking the time to listen to Episode 8. I'm hoping to, as I mentioned earlier, start releasing episodes a little more frequently, with the idea being that I make them shorter. I didn't accomplish that whole shorter thing today, but this flight was jam-packed with learning, so we went a little long. Remember to drop me a line and give me some feedback. You can contact me either from my website at www.studentpilotcast.com. There's a contact button in the upper right there. You can also leave comments on the entry for individual episodes if you wish to comment on those episodes and uh, leave them out there for everyone else to see as well. Finally, you can email me directly at bill at studentpilotcast.com. I hope you're finding these casts enjoyable. I'm Loving the training, enjoying all of the milestones that I'm hitting, and I'm always excited to move on to the next one. 
I've got a great flight to document in the next episode, so keep checking that podcatcher. Until then, adios from the Southwest. Today's audio cast is the song To Be an Angel from the great Canadian band Uncle Seth. You can get more information and subscribe to the Student Pilot audio cast using iTunes, Zune, or any other podcatcher at www.studentpilotcast.com.